Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's indeed a, a great pleasure and an honor to be here this afternoon. Um, obviously, when you're thinking of the running order of ICH documents, and um, obviously it's, it's, it's a very good idea to keep the best one till last. Um, and so E9 is the, obviously the best guideline, but I'm, I'm seriously biased in that regard because of my uh, love of statistics. Um, but before, if anyone in the room isn't a statistician, don't worry, th this guidance document isn't just for statisticians. It's for everyone really involved in clinical trials. Um, and I'll talk not only about E9, um, but also about the addendum to E9 that's currently being worked upon and will be finalized soon. Um, so to start off, I'll talk a little bit about myself and the reasons for that will become apparent when you see the next few slides. Um, then I'll introduce E9, talk about the key messages. It's impossible in an, in an hour to go through everything in E9. Um, but then I'll reflect on what's happened over the 20 years it's been used and what's changed in that time. And, and part of what's changed has led to the addendum. Um, so I'll explain why that is. So um, you'll see from my first slide that I w currently work for AstraZeneca. Um, but before that, and for the most of my working life, I, I was a, a regulator at the UK regulatory agency, which was the medicines control agency when I joined and then it became the MHRA, as you've already heard being referred to uh, in the previous talk. And during my time there, I was one of the authors on a paper that reflected on E9 sort of 10 years after it was um, introduced. Um, so I'm delighted now to come back even sort of another 10 years later, if you like, to reflect further on on the impact that the, uh, the guidance has had. Um, I will also co-authored the 2011 CHMP guideline on missing data. And during my working life there, I, was, uh, I became an expert statistical assessor and I chaired the, the Biostatistics Working Party for CHMP at the European Medicines Agency. Uh, so that was a group of statisticians from each member state in Europe uh, that helped CHMP with difficult statistical issues that they struggled with. And then they asked us to write guidance documents, like the missing data guidance document, for example. I'll explain in a bit how that interest led to the concept of estimands. I'm really, I, I really wanted to listen to the simultaneous translation at that point, because until 2010, the word estimand, although it did exist, wasn't really used at all. Um, so I'll explain a little bit about what that term is uh, and also talk about some other new words that have been invented in the addendum. So in that sense, it's groundbreaking to have new words as part of guidance documents. Okay, so ICHE 9 came into effect in 1998 um, and it outlines the statistical principles for the design and analysis of clinical trials um, that it will be part of a submission to a regulatory agency. And the good news is throughout its life it's been very well respected in the pharma industry and most of the document is still very, very useful today. Okay, so ICHE 9, who's it for? Everyone. It's for everyone, but sponsors, it's for you if you're designing a trial, working out how to conduct a trial, working out how to analyze a trial, and then when you get the results from the trial, how do you evaluate them? So that's, there'll be many people in a pharmaceutical company who'll be interested in that. Maybe you're a, uh, working in a regulatory agency, as, as an assessor, and then your job is to prepare a summary of that application for review, and you have to assess the evidence of efficacy and safety. So th that's 
a, a, a very broad group of people that this document is very useful for. Uh, but I think it, it goes even more broader than that. Um, and the addendum that's being brought in, I think, has great utility in, in a very diverse group of people. Mm. Okay, as I said, I start by reflecting on the key messages in E9. Uh, and some of these sections I was asked to go into details from, from, from the organizers. But the first one is a key one about pre-specification of analyses. So it seems very odd to be standing up here today to say that back in 1998, that maybe the confirmatory analysis, um, the primary variable, it wasn't actually mentioned in the statistical analysis plan or the protocol. Finds hard to believe, maybe. But in fact, in some occasions it wasn't. Um, and both documents have to be finalized before breaking the blind. So that's another th comment to, to make about the difference between the protocol and the statistical analysis plan. Uh, the reason, the, the main reason for pre-specification is to avoid multiple, multiplicity concerns. Or to explain that in a non-technical way, um, you shouldn't have multiple chances to win in a clinical trial. If you're playing a game of, of cards or a game of chance, you've got one go at winning. You have to put all your cards on the table in a phase three trial. That's why it's a very risky business being in the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. If you get it wrong or the drug doesn't work, all that money you've invested doesn't come to anything. But that's the game that we're in. It's right that regulators control the, the false positive rate it's called the type one error in clinical trials at the 5% level. And, and if you don't pre-specify the analyses, you wouldn't, the regulator wouldn't be confident or wouldn't be able to have confidence that you had uh, controlled the type one error. But anyway, the good news is that by putting this in E9, uh, this has largely gone away as a, a problem. Primary analysis is now routinely defined. But as you'll see from the addendum, sometimes the primary analysis is still very loosely written. And so it allows some scope for different things to be done. And again, sometimes that's reasonable, but often it's not. And I'll go into some details about that later. When I first started as a regulator, there was a big argument between the FDA and Europe about how to analyze multi-center trials. And again, it was one of the successes of E9 that it brought together the parties from both sides of the Atlantic and for them to come to an agreement on how to analyze them. Everyone agreed the reason why multi-center trials were necessary to speed up recruitment and provide a better base for generalizing the results of the study. Uh, but the guidance document goes into details about how you analyze a multi-center trial. So that's another success, a success story, which now is largely not mentioned as being a, a technical issue. It's just known this is the way to do it. Mm. Subgroup analyses. So the document does go into some details about subgroup analyses and talking about stratifying for factors that are expected to have an important influence on the primary variable. Um, so you should account for those factors in the analysis if you stratify the randomization, for example. However, as part of a submission to a regulatory agency, you will also um, have to do lots of other subgroups analyses. You'll have a, a big exploratory set um, and many statisticians out there will be able to tell you, well, of course, you're going to find some sort of false positive findings because you've looked at so many things. Um, so the interpretation of those subgroup analyses has to be done with caution. This is where a regulator can have um, 
two faces, as it were. If they're thinking about efficacy, they might view things in one way, and if they're looking at safety, they might look at it in a different way. And the reason for that is they're trying to protect the public, that's their job, um, and so if they, they can't take chances, they might need to restrict your label in some cases, even if, statistically, they don't have full technical justification for that because you as a company could always prove them wrong by doing a trial in that subgroup if you wished. And so that's a, a reason for their position which is entirely justified. Mm. Now if we go more up to date in terms of subgroup analyses, lots of things have happened since E9 has been written. Um, E17 has been written on multi-regional clinical trials and of course they mention subgroups a lot in that document and update you on uh, the new philosophy that wasn't around then which is maybe you're going to do one enormous trial throughout the world and that was going to serve as the trial for all the regulatory agencies. It might be bigger than the two trials that you were going to do in the US for example when combined with two trials you might have done in Europe and two trials you might have done somewhere else. So you can see from a company's point of view, they want reassurance that, that one mega trial is sufficient uh, and E17 goes into details about how to do that. Um, the CHP guideline on subgroups, which has recently been finalized, talks about those tricky situations I was alluding to just a minute ago. For example, imagine you did a trial that was statistically significant, but then you found a negative finding in a subgroup. What should you do about that? Mm. Or maybe the trial overall was not significant. Is it ever possible to rescue a failed trial by looking in a particular subgroup and finding a dramatic effect? The answer to the latter question is it's hardly ever possible, but obviously we can never say never in this world, um, it depends on the findings and the particulars, but generally that would be a no-no because of the, the, you've already used your type 1 error on your primary analysis. But this um, CHMP guidance document goes in some details there. Mm. E9 does talk a little bit about safety as well, and I'd just like to flag up a very good book, um, the SIAMS 10 document, Evidence Synthesis and Meta-Analysis for Drug Safety, uh, which I was involved with along with many other people. Um, and that document talks about the statistical principles behind aggregating safety data. It's a very complex business. Some trials will be very short, some trials will be very long. Some trials will have multiple doses of the drug, some only one. If you're submitting um, an overall, your overall evidence of safety to a regulator, how do you do that? And the, and the SIAMS 10 document talks about evidence synthesis for those purposes, but also for internal purposes for a company as, as they're building up evidence on a drug before even they get to that position of filing to a, to a regulatory agency. The discussion is, is relevant to the later the, my later talk uh, on estimands, as you'll see in due course. Okay, so now here we are, 20 years on or more, as it were, what has changed? Well, I mentioned one big topic, uh, that of missing data. And I'll go to some details about that and how that topic led to the addendum being written um, and this new terminology about estimands. I'll talk about the uh, relevance of that to analysis sets um, and then I'll also, also talk about non-inferiority studies that back in 1998 were only just starting. Okay, missing data. So, even in E9, back in 98, they did make some very good um, suggestions and highlighted some of the issues with missing data. Specifically, that if the pattern or the timing of missing data is different, 
in the two treatment arms that you might commonly have in a two-arm clinical trial, this can lead to difficulties in, in the analysis and the interpretation as well. So you have to think carefully about how you're going to do it, but I'll explain how the mindset has changed since then, because you'll notice there I was very much talking about the analysis um, of the trial in the presence of missing data. But uh, just hold that thought for a little bit longer. So when myself and others reflected on E9 after 10 years, in 2008, we reflected that the area of missing data wasn't really adequately addressed in regulatory submissions. This led to the missing data guideline being revised in 2011. Uh, meanwhile, the FDA were also unhappy with the way that missing data was being treated, and they convened an expert panel which produced a document, The Prevention and Treatment of Missing Data in Clinical Trials, uh, which was uh, an excellent report highlighting some of the issues uh, to do with missing data. So there was overlap between those two documents, but there was also areas where there was, well, either disagreements or maybe different framing of the problem. But interestingly, in that 2010 report, it did refer to S demands for the first time in my, in my experience, that's the first time I saw the, the word. If you're an uh, eminent academic, I'm sure you'll find lots of references it's to it in older papers, but it won't be in the context that we'll talk about now. Mm. So as I said, over the time we were having discussions when I myself was a regulator with pharmaceutical companies and academics, there seemed to be a mismatch in the analysis that were being provided and what the an analyses that we as regulators thought we needed. So we didn't really know why that was because we weren't talking the same language. That was a big problem. Um, and then someone about this time came up with this real example where there wasn't any missing data but there was still a problem. So it's been an example that's been used a lot um, since then, but uh, so if you've seen it before, I apologize. But if you, uh, if you haven't, just uh, bear with me. So this is an example in type two diabetes where we're measuring um, HbA1c for 24 weeks in patients randomized to two treatments, but one of two treatments, A or B. Um, so you'll see here a sponsor dis w thought that this would be a good idea, that some patients obviously would have to have rescue medication at some point in the trial because they were inadequately controlled on their medication. Basically their HbA1c levels were still up when they went to clinic and the, and the physician wasn't prepared to continue giving them that product or they were happy to give them that product if they in addition, took some rescue medication. So the sponsor thought, well, hold on, the data that we've got on after the tape person takes some rescue medication isn't relevant to the effect of the drug that they've been given, drug A, for example. Whereas the FDA said, no, no, we want like to see all the data regardless of the initiation of rescue medication. So you can see in both of those cases there's full information available on that patient, but there's a, a mismatch with how you would then analyze it between the sponsor and the FDA. Mm. Um, and then we get to the first clue about the term estimand. So here we say, what is the scientific question of interest here? And, and this is a less, I'm probably ashamed to say, why didn't I think of this in 1999 or whatever when I started as a regulator? Why did it take everyone so long to find this? I mean, I think we were often saying to companies, what are you trying to do? Why are you doing this? But we didn't frame it so well. 
Um, so here it seems like the sponsor is attempting to establish the treatment effect of initially randomized treatment had no patient received rescue medication, whereas the FDA is, would like to compare two treatment policies, that of A, and in some patients, some people got rescue medication, so that's A plus rescue, compared with other patients who either received B or B plus rescue. So, there you are. That was a, a plain disagreement there between two stakeholders in the system, let us say, um, and they were disagreeing over what to estimate, and that is an example of an estimand. Right, so, you've just hopefully learned one new word, and so now another one comes along. Mm. It's not going to be like buses where three new words, this is the last new word. Uh, it's intercurrent events. So, here you see seven patients represented. They could be in that uh, diabetes trial, but they could be in a, another longitudinal trial where you're measuring patients maybe with a chronic condition like asthma or COPD, uh, heart failure, those sort of things. Some of them, like patient one, uh, discontinued treatment after a period of time due to lack of efficacy. Another patient takes the drug all the way through the treatment duration, nothing happens to them, and you measure them at the end. Patient three, you'll see we uh, saw what happened to them for a period of time, and then they discontinued the study, and then had no idea what happened to them after that. Patient four got some rescue medication before the end, and then was followed up to the end. Patient five died halfway through the study, so obviously no information could be collected after that point. Um, patient six was different as well, because they discontinued treatment due to an adverse event. And then, then you can see, you can have the, lots of combinations of the, the previous six things. So patient seven's an example of someone who had rescue medication and then discontinued the study later. So, most of these things are examples of what are now termed intercurrent events. The document thought long and hard of a word for this, so this is what they came up with. They didn't want to call it post-randomization events because sometimes the study might not be randomized. This is a, a guidance that's very general. Um, and just to make it clear, the final version of the document will also make it clear that study discontinuation is not an intercurrent event. The other ones on here uh, do fit the, the, the definition that they're making, but study discontinuation is different. And the reason for that is you can say, well, that's more like missing data, as it were. They just discontinued the study. Then we're not sure what happened to them. All these other things, as you see here, the data isn't missing. It's just what happened the, to them causes a problem in the interpretation of the treatment effects at the end of the study. And I must say, you'll see a slightly different tinge to some of these slides here, and I just need to acknowledge the um, ICH E9R1 addendum working group for some of these slides. Sorry, I, s I forgot to say that before. Um, so, what we're talking about here is that in the old days, as it were, there were lots of techniques for missing data were being discussed. Some were criticized, then there were some new methods, and then they were criticized as well. But then when you think about it more carefully in a particular problem, like the diabetes one, you see that there was an imprecise definition of the question. So that's, that was the problem. And in all of this, the meaning of what I hope most of you are aware of the ITT, Intention to Treat Analysis, which is a principle to include all randomized patients, essentially, had been obscured in the co complications that can happen to patients after randomization. So, here we go, a nice colorful slide explaining some of the components that you need to specify uh, 
to work out what an S demand is. So there are four on this slide, but um, I, I know what's in the final version of the document, which will be released at the end of the month, and there's the fifth bubble that's going to be added to this, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but in the, um, the draft, there were four. So, and I'll go through an example in a minute to make it clear, uh, hopefully, how these things interplay. So you, you, d you can't do these things in isolation. You have to go around in circles thinking about what population are you trying to treat, what endpoint is it interest, but even just specifying the endpoint isn't enough. For example, if you were in a COPD trial, you said, I'm interested in exacerbations. Somebody might, says, so might say to you, are you interested in the time to the first exacerbation, or are you interested in the rate of exacerbations? Because some patients have multiple exacerbations. So that's what the summary measure needs to be specified. And then, I, as I alluded to in the diabetes space, you have to specify all the intercurrent events that are, could occur in the trial and how they reflect, how you're going to handle them to, to reflect the scientific question of interest. So, as I say, the, um, the breaking news is there's a fifth part to that, because if you think about it, if you specify those four things, you haven't even said what treatments you're comparing which is obviously a, a fundamental problem with the, the specification. So the, the, and, it's, and then, of course, it's not necessarily just the treatments, but you have to think about the treatment strategies. So you might start off on one treatment, then go on to another treatment, or you might not be interested in that. So you have to talk about that when you're discussing the treatment component to the estimate. <coughs> Now, when um, the document was being put forward by um, different stakeholders, some at the FDA and some in Europe, the FDA were very keen to have a discussion about sensitivity analysis. Uh, and I'll give a shout out to Tom Permut, who was the guy who wanted this to happen. Um, uh, just because I hear from from Gerald that he, he retired last week and I enjoyed working with Tom a lot so uh, it's good to mention that and to shout out that this is an important component of the document um, which there was frustration in industry and frustration by regulators that you know how many analyses do you need to, to put in a, a, a submission? Um, sometimes companies would say oh it's never ending we just have to keep and provide more and more analyses and then the other way around, um, the regulator would be uncertain why a company was just putting forward one. What about some others? Uh, and so the, there was a sort of a mismatch in expectations. Um, and I'll just explain why this new Esterman framework can help both parties, the regulators and the industry. <coughs> okay, so... Now, it's always good to look at things in pictures, um, but I've gone too far, but there we go. So, this is a great slide for explaining, if you don't remember much about this talk, remember that often you might hear statisticians saying how they're going to estimate something in a trial. If they do that to you, and you're not a statistician, maybe you're a clinician working in the process, saying, hold on a minute, I haven't told you what I want you to estimate yet. So until the, you tell them that, it's not possible to do the, the how part. And in, and in the old days, quite a lot of people would jump to the how before thinking about the what. So that's an, an important thing to remember. In any, um, when you're estimating something, you, m you have to make some assumptions and if you want to investigate those assumptions, you can do those as sensitivity analyses. Uh, but the document goes into an important distinction between sensitivity and supplementary analyses. It might sound very pedantic, but it's, it's very helpful. A supplementary analysis will be something that's targeting a different estimate. Again, previously, sometimes there were arguments saying, well, analysis one shows a treatment effect that's very nice, very large. Tr analysis two shows a much smaller 
benefit. And there was a uh, discussion, why is that? But if you uh, apply the Esterman framework, you might work out that in fact these two analyses are targeting very different questions. So it's not surprising necessarily that they come up with very different answers. So that's a, whereas the sensitivity analyses on the other hand should come up with similar answers and if they come up with different ones then that shows you the importance of some of the assumptions in those analyses and how key they are in your um, ability to draw conclusions from those. Okay, so <clears throat> just a little bit of statistics, but not on this slide, so don't worry. Uh, the first one, it's nice and straightforward, I'm going to give you three estimands in the diabetes space. All of them, the population's the same. Um, it's the post-approval population of type 2 diabetics. Each of them, we're going to do the same thing, which is change from baseline to 24 weeks after randomization in their HbA1c level. So the endpoint's the same. So the measure of intervention, though, is slightly different. So Esterman 1 just says, I don't care what treatment they actually got just measure their HbA1c levels. So here we're specifically just looking at one intercurrent event, that of rescue medication. In the second estimate, however, we have a different interpretation of the measure of in, in intervention effect. And here we're assuming that the treatment effect disappears and there's no rescue effect occurs if you meet the criteria. So basically, if you've, it's ba basically saying, well, the drug failed this patient because they didn't get an effect, and so we're going to force that to be a treatment failure. Effect Esterman 3 is slightly different again. It's saying, hold on, what's the effect? It's the effect of the randomized treatment had all patients remained on their randomized tre treatment throughout the study, i.e. assume that the the patients did not receive medica uh, the rescue medication. Yeah? So that's three different possibilities of things you could measure. Um, the analysis variable, then it becomes slightly different in the three cases, and the statistical model becomes very different in the three cases, and I'm not going to explain that here today, but it's just a, that's the first time where you've had to really understand statistics to, to do this. Up until this point, it's been very general about clinical trials. Uh, but more than happy, if there's some statisticians in the room that want to go into these details, I'm here till tomorrow morning, so I'm very happy to chat about them afterwards. Mm. Um, and then sensitivity analyses are different in, the, in those three cases as well. So, the addendum to E9 talks about the various strategies, I've talked about three there, that could be used to address a given intercurrent event. So the first one is technically, from an analysis point of view, very straightforward, um, because it's the treatment effect regardless of the intercurrent event. And that comes closest to what was traditionally called an ITT analysis or an ITT or, or things that are adhering to the ITT principle. Another option is when you do your design, you can think, for example, where you'd got mortality as an intercurrent event. Uh, maybe you were doing an oncology trial and you were interested in uh, whether or not patients have progressed on their treatment. So a way around the deaths, because the deaths are confounding the effect of progression. And so a way around that is to put death in the progression variable, and that's where progression-free survival came from. So that's an example of a composite endpoint that includes an intercurrent event in its definition. Obviously, that was invented years ago before any of this existed, but uh, it's, uh, in retrospect, that's what was happening. The third type of intercurrent event is hypothetical. And here, I have to say that it's an umbrella of, of um, things. So Esterman 2 and 3 are examples of hypothetical Estermans. 
what, what would happen if rescue medication wasn't available? What would happen if we assume there's no treatment effect if rescue medication was given? What if? So there's all these what ifs. And in some cases you might think, well, that's not a good idea. But if you try to tease out a particular um, scientific question, in my mind, most importantly, should we license this drug? And to do that, you really want a clear idea about that drug that isn't confounded by uh, what happens when they go on to other treatments. So a case might be able to be made for looking at that treatment effect, which is slightly, well, it is very different to a treatment policy. Um, when the working group got thinking about these strategies, they came up with these five. But the first thing to say is this isn't an, um, all the five that exist. Any of you out there might be able to dream up another one. It's just the only five they could think of at the time. Mm. Um, the fourth one um, is very difficult to explain, but it, it's basically what a patient really would like to know. If you're a physician and you're just about to give someone a drug, they'd like to know, will this drug work for them? And if it does, how well will it work? A clinical trial never tells you that because, well, hardly ever tells you that because most of the time you, you, you don't give the same patient both medications. You only give them one. And so you're estimating a slightly different thing to what the patient would like to hear. There are some experiments you can do that can address that very important question exactly. There are other approaches uh, in the causal inference world which can try and do that on the basis of clinical trials. But, so that's very technical and new statistical theory there. And the final one is, a, is a, an interesting case where, generally speaking, just looking at the treatment effects while the patient's on treatment isn't deemed to be a good way of summarizing the efficacy of the product. But it might be in a situation, imagine someone has got a terminal illness and you're trying to improve their quality of life. You're giving them a drug that is very well known in terms of its safety profile, and so you're very confident that this drug is not going to shorten their life. You're also very confident that it's not going to increase their lifespan either. If you knew all of that, which I agree you might not in many circumstances, but if you did, then giving them a drug to see whether their quality of life is improved while they're alive, of course, is very important to them and is a different estimate to ones we've talked about so far. And so that's called a while on treatment estimate. Okay, some other reflections from me. So like I say, the list of um, estimate strategies was not exhaustive. Just because you pick treatment policy for one intercurrent event doesn't mean you have to pick it for all of them. You could pick a hypothetical for one. You could, still, you could have while in treatment for another one. And that, in a way, is a, a, a beautiful thing and a frightening thing at the same time. Uh, it's beautiful because it gives you flex flexibility. It's frightening because... Um, where many of us will be used to having to communicate messages to a non-technical audience, and they'll say, well, that treatment effect, it was six millimeters of mercury on, on, the, on the blood pressure. What does that mean? And if you have to explain all of these intercurrent events to do that, that becomes quite a challenge for them to understand why you've done that and why it's important to tell them that when you're telling them that that was the treatment effect. So that is a problem, I don't deny that. Um, so, but that's the, the primary message there, don't, if ju someone just says, oh, I'm, I'm doing treatment policy, you, you, your answer should be, for which intercurrent event, and are you sure that you do, should do that for each of them? Because in many situations, that won't be the answer to the question. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to bear in mind is when you're uh, designing a clinical trial, you might, you're very likely to need more than one estimate. You'll have a primary estimate 
which will be needed to get over a regulatory hurdle. You might have a different S demand that will also be useful for the, uh, the regulators to conceptualize the overall view of the medicine. It won't be their primary concern, but they'll also be interested in it. And they'll, they may also have a safety S demand as well, so that, which they'll take into account when considering the risks and the benefits. But then afterwards, when you're trying to sell your drug, you have to go to a reimbursement agency. They might have a different S demand to the regulator. And because you want to use that clinical trial for them too, you might have to specify yet another S demand in your protocol. When you've done all of that, you have to think about the data requirements for each S demand. So if you don't, for what S demand two or whatever it was, you don't need the data after someone takes rescue medication because you're going to ignore it. But with S demand one, you're not. So if you know you need both of those S demands, you collect as much information as you can on all patients after they've taken rescue medication. But if in some scenarios it might all line up that you, you know, you say, oh no, this is the data I need to collect. But obviously you have to collect the maximum of all of the different S demands in terms of data. So you can then have all that material available for the different stakeholders who are going to evaluate that clinical trial. Okay, so the construction of an S demand is a, is a fine art. Um, and like I said, the important thing is you have to think of the trial objectives to start with. And so that happens first before you think about the data collection and how you analyze things. Clearly, if you can do something that's very simple in terms of analysis, but clinically it doesn't mean anything, then it's useless. So what, whatever your endpoint is, whatever's got to be clinically interpretable, um, and you know, so that, that's important. And it's also got to take into account the treatments, as I alluded to as well. Now, but the most important thing, which is a message for everyone. So I want all of you to go out here from today, and if someone says to you, ah, oh, yeah, they're revising E9 as an addendum, we all know that E9 is about statistics, and we also, the addendum, well, it's more statistics, yeah? So just get the stats department to look at that. Definitely not. So this is a clear message from me. That is not the case. Uh, the Esterman framework is a framework for the whole clinical team, um, and maybe more bro broader than that. You might need the commercial team when they're trying to work out what are we trying to do here for this product? Um, and that helps define the questions you're trying to address. Um, and so that's, it's multidisciplinary in that case. And then also, uh, and this makes me smile as I used to be a regulator and I used to be in charge of scientific advice at the MHRA. Um, so I was always encouraging companies to come to the agency for advice, because that was part of my job. But now I'm not a regulator. I do agree that if you're coming up with an unconventional S demand strategy, or in fact, you're trying out this framework for the first time, and you're not sure what the regulator's going to think about it, it seems obvious to me, but not to all companies, including mine, that you should be going to talk to the regulator about it to make sure they're happy with the strategy you're adopting. You have to do that for the FDA at the end of phase two and going into phase three, but for other regulators, it's your choice. Um, but maybe the FDA will have a different perspective to CHMP. They might have different perspectives to other agencies. So it's always good uh, to get all those perspectives on the table before you finalize your clinical trial. Okay, let's just change tack briefly. Uh, Non-inferiority trials, so they're very important to many people here in this room who might work on biosimilars, for example, and they might be doing uh, studies to sh that they know that the drug that they're working on shouldn't be better than the one that's out there because you're trying to, if you like, copy the one that's already on the market, and so you expect the efficacy to be comparable. 
And so you might, as part of that development, do a non-inferiority trial. Um, since E9 was written, a lot more non-inferiority trials have been performed, and there's been a lot more guidance out there that's been given. Um, 2006, um, CHMP gave a guidance document on non-inferiority margins and how to specify them. Um, the FDA gave a much longer guidance is, uh, on how to do that in 2016 that went into a lot more technical details about how you actually do the, the statistics behind the non-inferiority guidance, the uh, non-inferiority margin setting, whereas the CHMP guidance is more general in terms of the, the principles that you need to adopt. But they, they're in broad agreement. Mm. So how does this Esterman framework apply to non-inferiority trials? And this is one of the things that's caused problems when the addendum was released. There was a lot of disagreement in industry about that fact because in the old days it was easy. You had an ITT population and you had a per protocol population. But the addendum doesn't really talk about an ITT population anymore. It talks about specifying the population taking into account these intercurrent events. It thinks that the ITT principle is important, but that doesn't mean that your population is technically an ITT population. So, um, and similarly, you can get into difficulties uh, we're talking about per protocol populations. I imagine we have uh, doing a three-year trial and one, a subject misses one dose. So if you hadn't specified it very carefully, this may be a maybe they're not in the per protocol population. But that seems a bit crazy because they only miss one dose of medication in three years. But maybe that's because you didn't define it properly in your protocol. Um, but even then, you have to think about, say it's more than that, say they missed two doses, four doses, eight doses. At some point, you might think that this patient shouldn't be in that population that's looking at people who are taking the drug more as instructed than the, as they did in real life. So how do you handle or specify that? And it's quite a complex business, but, the, but again, the, the, the uh, addendum to E9, that framework, helps you in specifying that for these patients. So I think, so I'm hoping that th that can make non-inferiority studies better specified and then easier to analyze. Um, the addendum to E9 has been um, looked at differently in different therapeutic areas. So in areas like diabetes, asthma, COPD, where you have t typically one, two, or three-year clinical trials, um, looking at, a, in some cases, a continuous endpoint, some cases um, uh, exacerbation, so uh, it's not quite the same, but in all of those cases, they can see how the framework works. In oncology, for example, there's been a lot more reticence about the framework, um, and they've taken a little bit more convincing. But I would say that all studies can benefit from utilizing the framework. If you think about oncology trials, um, and you think about the situation that someone misses a scan, for example, um, and then you never see them again. So you knew they were alive at six months, for example. Their next scan was at nine months, but they didn't turn up for that. Or maybe another patient, they missed that scan, but they were back at one year. So th those are, if you see, it's the same thing in terms of thinking about how you would handle that patient in the analysis can benefit by using this framework. In the oncology community, they have thought about those issues. Uh, and it's interesting, again, there's disagreement of, uh, in different regulatory authorities about to how to handle that. But m maybe this framework will help the discussion about that. We're never going to agree on everything, but at least it will establish what we don't agree on, uh, which is also useful to know. Um, OK. so. Uh, nearly at the end. Um, so some 
Final reflections. So I'm delighted to say that the E9 is still an excellent document, and if you're just starting out in the pharmaceutical industry looking into clinical trials, it is very time well spent reading the document, questioning your colleagues when you say, well, why does it say that? You know, um, can you give me more information about that, etc.? It's a, a mind of information, and in most companies, they make it uh, obligatory for people working in the clinical trial arena to start off reading E9. But of course, you know, time marches on, things change, um, and so there are new things there that weren't around in so much uh, in the late 1990s, some of which I've spoken about, subgroup analysis, missing data, non-inferiority trials, meta-analysis and estimands, but of course, I didn't talk about adaptive designs at all. Um, there's guidance on that that was hardly any mention about that in E9. That was because there wasn't much regulatory experience back then of adaptive clinical trials. Now there is, and so there are various documents being written on those. I'm delighted that the framework's been written and the addendum's been written. Um, and just to say, uh, I've got some news on the next slide about uh, what's happening next, as it were, in terms of the the guidance document, and, and how you can be involved in that process. So, and the reason that you, everyone's needed is, as I tr tried to explain, communicating what's been done in terms of the Esterman strategy is, I would say, a, a regulatory nightmare. Mm. Um, and, and even if we got everything right from tomorrow, there would still be a problem because old public assessment reports, old labels would say the treatment effect of this drug is this much. And you would say, well, how did they handle this in the analysis? And it wouldn't be there in, in the public document. So there would still be problems for a while. Uh, and some people have said, well, maybe regulators should start by publishing a range of estimands in their public documents as just to, for a, a five-year period to see what, how that, whether that helps. Um, but we're in uncharted territory, and we're obviously we're just about to start the implementation period of this addendum. So it would be interesting to see how that pans out. The, the addendum uh, will be finalized at the end of this month, and I'm told it will be published next month on the ICH website, so you can see that. The ICH working group realized that an implementation group's needed, so they've recommended to ICH that an implementation working group is formed. They will partner with ICH M11, um, which is working on protocol templates, because if you think of a protocol template at the moment, in the past, it doesn't, it doesn't mention estimands. So how do we incorporate that into the ICH template? So that'll be one of the jobs. And once you see that, that will help everyone when they're trying to use that language in their protocols going forward. The, the working group are also going to, I've been screaming at them to, to develop case studies. Um, and it's quite difficult for them to do that because not unreasonably regulators don't want to be seen to saying, well, this is the right way of doing it when it might only be a way of doing it. So we've got to come up with some s case studies in various areas so people can see how it works in practice. And, and the working group will also have some face-to-face -face meetings to help and explain that. Um, so I hope you get the opportunity to interact in that process and, and help split, spread the word throughout your companies if you're in company. Uh, if you're in academia, this applies to you as well. Uh, it, it's a very good framework to utilize there. Um, so wherever you are, as, as regulators as well, um, I think it's an excellent thing to be working on. Um, but like I say, there's still these uncertainties that need to be ironed out to fully utilize its potential. Okay, so I think that's me finished. If you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to have them now in, in any language I can understand through this. Um, and including English without that. If you want to email me, you can email me at that address there. 
Um, I'm here this evening if anyone wants to talk to me afterwards as well. But thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wright. 지금부터 질의응답 시간 가지도록 하겠습니다. 질문 있으신 분은 통로 측의 마이크 사용해서 질문해 주시기 바랍니다. I know we've played a game about how far everyone's come, but uh, <웃음> it, I, I just remember the flight was uh, 11 hours long, so that was quite a way. So, um, uh, 시, 질문 있으신 분안 계실까요? Ah, 네, 저쪽에 질문 있으시네요. <웃음> 네, 그 좋은 프레젠테이션을 해주셔서 감사합니다. 어, 저는 임상 설계를 하고 있고 어, 가끔씩 이래 통계를 가끔씩 돌려보는데 가끔씩 어, 그 p 밸류가 0.05 이렇게 딱 나올 때가 있습니다. 그럴 때는 이게 이 약에 효과가 있는 건지 아니면 진짜 효과가 없는 건지 그렇게 궁금할 때가 있고요. 그리고 어, 주로 이제 1차 평가 변수를 설정하게 되는데 어, 프로토콜에 따라서 평가를 했을 때는 좀 효과가 잘안 나올 때가 있는데 뭐 앙코바나 뭐 다른 통계 방법을 돌렸을 때좀 효과가 덜어 나오는 경우가 좀 있더라고요. 그럴 때는 이 약이 또 효과가 있는지 없는지 그게 좀 궁금합니다. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, so, to avoid some of the problems you alluded to, that's why E9 talks about pre-specification. Um, you're right, of course, that it's very possible that a, a drug does have beneficial effects, but that um, when the primary endpoint isn't um, statistically significant. But the point of that is, um, an exercise has been gone through, a, a pharmaceutical company will have done many trials before that in phase one and phase two. They've had discussions with clinicians where it's been uh, agreed upon what's the most relevant endpoint, uh, which they think that if there wasn't a benefit on that endpoint, then they wouldn't really trust that the treatment was effective. So that's how the primary endpoint becomes defined. Um, and like I was, I was talking about, the type 1 error, that is, which is, relates to the, the p-value, as you know. It's a bit, so what uh, the FDA have historically been looking for is two trials with a p-value less than 0.05 on that, if you like, that same primary endpoint. And if they've got that, they've got replication of effect in another trial, so they feel confident that the drug does work as uh, the company is um, uh, uh, claiming. Um, of course, there are in in instances where um, no one really knows what the best endpoint should be. Uh, maybe in, that can be in conditions where there aren't many things licensed for a particular treatment. And then I do agree, it does get more difficult to decide what the primary endpoint should be uh, if you're in that field. And I sympathize with you. Now I'm on the other side of the fence. And I know sometimes it can be frustrating when you see that a medicine has quite a lot of value, but of course it fails on the particular endpoint that you chose. Uh, but that's, unfortunately, when you're in a, such an innovative field, that can sometimes happen. Um, and unfortunately, well, not, I, I think rightly, regulators have to have a set hurdle that everyone has to adhere to. Um, and if they're not confident that you've got over that, then it's right that they reject the application. 네, 추가 질문 있으신 분 지금 질문해 주시기 바랍니다. 이제 기회가 얼마 남지 않았는데요. 네. 질문 한분 더, 네, 두분더 있으시네요. 아, 안녕하십니까. 구제약 관련한 질문을 하나 하고 싶은데요. 어, 임상, 임상시험 진행하면서 그 위약군이 특히 있는 경우에는 이제 임상시험에 참여하도록 하기 위해서 이제 구제약을 제공을 하게 되는 경우가 있는데요. 어, 사실 이제 데이터 측면에서는 구제약 쓰지 않는 것이 좋다라는 것을 알면서 이제 구제 뭐 워낙에 예를 들어서 통증이 워낙에 있는 질환이라든가 이제 그런 경우에는 기본적으로 약간의 그 구제약을 쓰면서 갈 수밖에 없는 경우도 있는 것 같습니다. 근데 이제 나중에 데이터를 해석하는 부분에 있어서 
그 구제약의 부분을 어떻게 배제하고 이제 해석할 수 있는 어떤 층, 그 방법이 있는지 또는 그 관련한 저희가 스폰서 입장으로서 가이드나 이런 부분 좀 구할 수 있는 부분이 있는지 궁금합니다. 예, thank you for the the question. Yeah, pain is a a very good example um, where rescue is necessary because clearly patients uh, won't um, participate in a clinical trial uh, if they're not allowed to take rescue medication. You can't stop them doing that. But obviously, when they do do that, it complicates the uh, interpretation of, of whether your drug is effective or whether it's really a combination of your drug and the rescue medication, or in some cases, just the rescue medication. Um, so a very draconian approach can be to just say, well, if someone takes rescue medication, they're a failure. So that, that's, you can then come up with a composite, which is just success or failure. Success is uh, they took the drug for the, the whole time and they uh, were successfully treated, their, their pain improved. Um, but for pa patients whose pain got worse, or that they took rescue medication, they were a failure. So that's a, you can understand that approach, but unfortunately by that, that approach has quite low statistical power generally, um, and so other approaches can be used, um, and some of them then get into what is an example of a hypothetical estimand, which is one of the estimands I was describing, uh, where you say, well, what if they hadn't taken the rescue medication? And that can be a, a useful way of trying to uh, tease out the effect of the originally randomized treatment and it, that approach has been accepted by some regulators in the past so it's not that it hasn't got uh, some regulatory precedence. Mm. 네, 다음 분 질문 부탁드립니다. 네. 어, 저는 어, 박성훈이라고 합니다. 저는 CRO에서 통계를 했던 사람입니다. 어, 지금 말씀해 주셨는 에스티맨드에 대한 개념을 어, 처음에 프로토콜을 작성할 때 그것들 포함을 시킬 수 있는지 좀 궁금하고 만약 포함이 된다면은 어떤 식으로 설계를 할수 있을지 좀 궁금한 부분이 있습니다. Okay. So yeah. Um, so yes, it, I think it should do. Uh, and so naturally at the moment I think it it re requires a, a rewriting of proto the protocol template, and that's what many pharmaceutical companies are going through that process at the moment, thinking about how to uh, rewrite the protocol template because it, it, this framework doesn't fit in because it's got a statistics section and it's got a clinical section where it hasn't got an estimate section as such. Um, so I'd say watch this space because I think it's work in progress. Um, but I think you can do it, and I, I, I heard a good talk when someone didn't try to call it um, more the clinical objective of the trial, specifying that in the protocol, and then talking about those five attributes that I described, you know, the, the population, the treatments, uh, and all the other attributes. If you describe all of those there, you might not formally be talking, even saying estimand, but you are specifying it, and then, then that will drive through what th you think the um, statistical analysis should be as well. So it's a way, it, it's a, a very good way of doing it. Um, so I think it's an exercise you should try and do uh, in your company uh, when you're designing a clinical trial. But it, it probably will require you to rewrite some templates to do it. Mm. 혹시 추가 질문 있으신 분 계십니까? Thank you.